And welcome to this week's edition of the National Hour. He's Hayden Grove. I'm Jeff Hammersley. Hayden, let's start off some college basketball. First off, Ohio State college basketball. Buckeyes getting off the losing skid. They dropped four games in a row, took on the fighting Illini, but they find a way to win 62-55. to Yeah, after losing four straight, it, it just seemed like everything was gloom and doom with the Buckeyes. The, uh, the stadium, the, the shot was a little, uh, was not so empty, but it was just, you know, it was yeah. dead for the first half. It was not, it was not lively, so... Um, second half, though, everything kind of turned around for them. They shot the ball well. The crowd got into it. Things went their way and finally secured a fifth W. Really for the Buckeyes and the Illini, both teams entering that game ranked eighth in the Big Ten. So historically, looking at that, those teams really haven't been that low this early but for the Buckeyes. Sitting in the eighth spot, and at run for the final game, the final box score, I should say, the Buckeyes shooting 41.7%, 20 of 48 from the field, less than spectacular numbers. And at halftime, the Buckeyes trailed the Illini by a point, 25-24. But I think the question I'm going to ask you, Hayden, is this. At halftime, did you think the Buckeyes could let this game slip away and that would become their fifth straight loss in a row? They were shooting, uh, they were shooting 24 per, or 29% in the first half, so I did. I thought that they were going to come out second half um, kind of the same way, and it was just going to be a disaster. But... Um, they did turn it around. As I said, you know, they put the ball in the hoop. And I think that's the biggest problem with them right now. It's just offensive confidence. They just don't, they don't move their all, the, ball well, the ball well in the half right. court. And, you know, it, it, puts to get, it just stagnates everything. So um, the fact that they shot well in the second half probably was a big boost going into Wednesday's game against uh, Penn State and mm -hmm. could be a big boost going forward. It was just important to get over that hump. And I think, you know, they hit rock bottom when they shot 7 of 24 yep. in the first half. I think for me, going into halftime, the word that would have described my reaction would have been uneasiness. I think if you're Ohio State, you're down by one. It's The signs are pointing to this could be another loss. You saw with Nebraska, that game got away from, from them for a little bit. Then Michigan State, they were out for most of that game. But I think for the Buckeyes, it was, it's one of those situations that always occurs in their games. If they get down by five or six, they start cranking shots up, then that six-point deficit turns into a nine-point deficit, then it's 10-11, then they have to fight back and rally from that. But luckily for the Buckeyes, they got back, took over the game in the second half, and won the game by seven points. Still not a big victory, but a victory nonetheless. But Hayden, with this Buckeye victory, what propelled them to take down the Illini at home? It was Lonzel Smith. I'm going to be straight up with you. I mean, he finished four of eight from the field. He was uh, f four of eight from... Four of eight from the three-point line. Okay, so he was four of eight from the three-point line. So very a, good numbers yeah, right did, there. Yeah, did a spectacular job, but was a five of 11 from the field. You know, he's, we've been talking about him as a senior leader and a guy who hasn't really shown up lately. And finally, comes into the game, shoots the ball well. Um, after the game, he, he talked a little bit about, you know, just seeing the smiles in the, in the, in the locker room and whatnot. And I think it was big. I think it was a big moment not only for him but for, you know, the team. And I think they need senior leaders, a la Aaron Kraft, a la Lenzel Smith, to step up and, you know, play their game. And that's how, you know, that's how they're going to get back to winning basketball games. I think I'm going to go with the, sort of the same route. With, it was part of Lenzel Smith. But I'm going to say the team second half mentality in general. Buck has come out firing 54.2% from the field, 13 of 24. As you said, they were 7 of 24, 29.2% in the first half. And looking back to the, the Illini's numbers, the Illini, even though they shot 44%, the Buckeyes were still able to hold them at bay. The Buckeyes could easily let them shoot like lights out. We've seen in games against Nebraska a 50% team shooting from the field. Minnesota, the same kind of deal. Iowa, the same kind of deal. Where the Buckeye defense just lets them shoot at will and they're making shots. The Buckeye defense clamping down, held the Illini back. And really for Ohio State, it's a big morale booster winning at home. To sort of try to revive the fan base there. Because as you said, that first half, fans were essentially on their hands until late in the game. The Buckeyes were slowly starting to pull away and get the victory. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was great to see because for the past four games, we haven't seen any of that. We haven't seen any of the, you know, the rah-rah and the camaraderie and the spirit that you usually see with the Buckeyes. But um, I just wanted to comment real quick that I think a big factor in this win was Ohio State's defense as well. I mean, we yeah. talk about their defense all the time and how good it is, but I think in this specific matchup, it was really, really important. Um, Illinois guard Ravante Rice, who went off against um, Indiana, I think, yep. this weekend, had a really good game. Uh, finished 0 of 8 from the field against Ohio State, so holding him down was big. Um, although Egwu did have a big game, I think that they did a relatively good job with him, under, you know, apart from the fact, I mean, we've been struggling, Ohio State's been struggling so much with uh, interior presence, yep. and I think just playing well against him would, 
was definitely a big factor. So, you know, I think the defense stepped up and made a difference as well. For, for the Buckeyes, their next game, as you mentioned earlier, is going to be Wednesday, January 29th against Penn State at home. What do you expect from this Ohio State team in this game? Do you expect maybe some more shooting in from Lindell Smith, some more making baskets, or do you see a different aspect of the game that's going to shine for the Buckeyes against the, against the Nittany Lions? I see a loose team. I see a loose team coming out, playing really well uh, tomorrow night. I think they're finally, you know, it was a tough stretch. It was four straight losses. They're kind of looking for their identity. And I don't think they're, as Thad Mata said in his press conference, you know, they are not done. They're not even close to finding where they need to be yet. But I think they're going to come out much loose. Maybe, you know, they're not going to take Penn State lightly, but I think they're going to take it as more opportunity to look in themselves rather than at their opponent. Because Penn State has struggled this year, and, um, but if they do, if they do look past Penn State, they're going to struggle. But I, I think Ohio State will have, a, uh, will have a much more, you know, calm, cool, and collected outlook offensively, and I think it's going to help them. I see them winning 75-63, to 63, Ohio 75, State. 75-63. 60, I'm going to go maybe... 70-64, I think Penn State, they're going to get close. They haven't, they've been blown out a few times, but they've kept it close in general. I think for Ohio State, it's going to be one of those shoot okay in the first half, maybe try to play conservative second half. Penn State starts getting a couple of shots to fall, then they get back into this game. They won't win it, but they'll get within striking distance of the Buckeyes. But looking for Ohio State, their next three games, at home against Penn State, then at Wisconsin on February 1st, and at Iowa on the 4th of February, 14 and 15th ranked teams respectively. So for the Buckeyes, the schedules only are get harder as we move on. Yeah, there's never an easy game in the Big Ten. You know, as we talk about SEC all the time in football, them being the dominant conference, that's kind of how the Big Ten is in college basketball. It's a really, really competitive conference from top yep. to bottom. Um, so again, I think after this Iowa game too, I think the next game after that might be Illinois. So they go back to Illinois and then they play Michigan, yeah. which is the number one team in the Big Ten right now. They haven't lost a Big Ten game. So as you said, it doesn't get easier. Uh, the Wisconsin game is going to be a good test because last season, if you remember correctly, they got blown yep. out in Wisconsin. Got blown out, embarrassed. You know, oh, it was kind of like it was kind of the exact same thought process that we're thinking now. Is this team going to even make the tournament? Um, you know, what are, what are they going to do? And I think that's going to be a big test. If they come out and do that again, we might be right in saying, oh, this team might not even be tournament bound. But if they play well against Wisconsin, I would definitely think that they'd, uh, they'd build some momentum going forward. Mentioning of Michigan a few seconds ago, that's where we're going to transition to. Michigan took down Michigan State in a 21 versus 3 matchup in East Lansing, 80 to 75. University of Michigan now the lone undefeated team now in the Big Ten in conference play. And for Michigan, they slayed three straight top ten opponents. And a number three Wisconsin team on the road took down number ten Iowa at home. Then they took down number three Michigan State on the road, as we just mentioned. But really for this UM team, Nick Straskis was named Big Ten Player of the Week for a second straight week. And the debate now really is, Hayden, is Michigan for real? Yeah. It's, you can't argue with numbers. At the end of the day, you can't argue against wins and losses. And Michigan has won seven Big Ten games, and they've lost zero Big Ten games. And um, beating three top ten teams in a row in Michigan State, although it was a hobbled Michigan State without Adrian Payne, who you know, destroyed the Buckeyes when he was in, um, in there for Michigan State. But uh, I, I'd like to think that you know, Michigan is a good team, and they're missing McGarry right now, and that's a, certainly a huge blow for them. But at the same time, they have, they've played well. They've beaten teams they've needed to beaten or to to have beat, and um, I don't know. I just I, I think that they are absolutely the number one team right now. Do I think that they are at the end of the day the number one team when when we when we're talking about this come tournament time? No, no. I don't believe that. But right now, as of this moment, yes, they are. I think I will agree with that. When Nick Strask is going off for 19 points, also Derek Walter Jr. He's also scoring 19 points. Glenn Robinson, the third, nine points. Stoskis and Robinson, the third part of that, that final four run last year, they were runners up. Really, everybody else left, so these guys come back in. I remember early in the season, they lost to Charlotte, and it's like, well, the Big Ten, this could be a struggling season for them. Michigan now catching their own, going on a roll here. But, yeah, I agree. I think this team, even though they're 15-4, same amount of losses as Ohio State, but I think they are a for real team, especially when the Big Ten season's opened up. They worked out all the kinks prior in the pre before they went to Big Ten the schedule. And this team, I can see them at least getting maybe a 2-3 seed into the tournament if they keep this up. Right, and that's the thing. I think, honestly, the turning point for Michigan one way or another is going to be when they play Ohio State here. Ohio State does not travel to Michigan this year. Michigan travels to Ohio State. They play one time. 
So I think that is going to be their turning point. If they don't play well against Ohio State and they lose, I think it's right. going to be all downhill. But if they play Ohio State well and they win, I think they're going to solidify themselves as that number two or even number one seed as you were talking about. So um, I, right now I just don't see any real – I mean, I see a big flaw in the fact that they don't play well. They don't play – they don't have a particularly big team right yeah. now. And, you know, neither does Ohio State. So that will be a very interesting matchup. But when McGarry gets back, it's going to be really interesting to see what that team can do. Do you think Michigan is the strongest team in the Big Ten in this season right now? Or do you think maybe Michigan State, even though they lost that game, they are strong because they have Appling and Harris and Costello to help move the team and Kaminsky. But in the Big Ten Journal, who's the strongest team at this point in time? Right in this very minute, it's Michigan. I mean, you, just because, in, if I can, you know, kind of quantify my state, statement, if Adrian Payne plays, I think Michigan State beats Michigan and solidifies themselves as the number one team in the conference. But Adrian Payne didn't play, Michigan won, so right now they're the best team. Again, when Adrian, ba when Adrian Payne gets back and gets healthy, they're definitely going to be the best team in this conference. I don't have a doubt about that. I think for me, the strongest team, even though they lost, I think it's Michigan State. Yeah. I think the leadership, you have Izzo, you have Costello, Appling, Harris, Kaminsky, and company. That, that core set of four guys right there, I think that's enough to sit there and go, look, if they hit dire straits, this team has got to rebound right back. Things could have gone wrong after the Ohio State game. They could have realized, wow, we're not that good, and they could have just felt that could have been a mental blow to them, knowing that they were up so much mm -hmm. and let the Buckeyes back into them back into the game, but I think this Michigan State team, we've seen time and time before, this team is consistently good year in, year out. They rarely had a year where they've been god-awful. Yep. And now I think for this season, 7-1, and 18-2 right now, two quality losses. They weren't losing to anybody except, I believe, Texas or somebody in the beginning of the season. Mm -hmm. But it's, I mean, this team, I still think they're a very good team. I think they are the strongest team in the Big Ten, even though Michigan is undefeated. Yeah, I would look out for Iowa, too. Iowa's kind of hitting their own right now. Um, they beat Ohio State. They've played well. Um, I don't think they're the strongest team, but I do think they're definitely up there. I, I didn't really, you know, at the beginning of the year, they weren't, they didn't stand out in any way, but I think they're really hitting their stride, and they could be, cause some big problems down the stretch. On the flip side, who do you think is the weakest team in the Big Ten right now? Penn State is technically the weakest team in terms of record, but I, I might go with, like, in Indiana. I mean, Indiana's good, but they're, I mean, not, they're not good. That's the thing. They're not good. They're not good. Disregard my statement. Um, Indiana's, they, their record isn't as bad as everyone else's, but I don't know. They just don't play well against good. I, the Big Ten is tough to, to judge. There isn't a wor absolute worst team, in my opinion, because Penn State plays all their games really closely. Um, Northwestern has played some good, solid games. I'd say right now it's a toss-up between Penn State, Northwestern, and Indiana. And it's close, though. It's, it, again, I don't think any of those teams are bad. I just think that the Big Ten Conference right. is so good that it's, you know, they're the last on the totem pole. I think the disparity between the Big Ten, I think the teams from last year that were lower, they've sort of caught back up with the level mm -hmm. of play as the, as the top teams. Now they're not on par, but they're getting close to it. But I'm going I'm to agree and say it's Indiana's the weakest team. Looking for what they had last year, the team was completely gutted. I believe Will Sheehy uh, and a, one or two other guys, uh, uh, Yogi Ferrell, he came back. But everybody else left for the draft. So this Oladipo. team was, yeah, yeah. everybody's, they were depleted. You had Zeller, Oladipo, Christian Wofford. They're all gone now. Mm -hmm. This team has to rebuild. So I think organically you're supposed to grow year by year. When you lose that kind of that talent and roster, it's hard to actually come back and regrow. It may take a year or two, but I think right now for Indiana, they are in that rebuilding process at this point in time. Right. Last year, if you remember, it was supposed to be Indiana's championship yep. year. I mean, they were the number one seed. They were what everybody was looking at. And I think they fell in the Sweet 16. The, you know, somebody, so, I didn't, you know. I, I want to say Syracuse, maybe, but I'm not Syracuse? sure. Okay, well, regardless, it was, it was supposed to be their year. They were talking about a national championship. Then you lose four starters, you know, who had huge impact on that team and, Tom Crean's left with basically yep. Copper Bear, and it happens to a lot of programs like Calipari. But he, you know, I think Calipari does a better job because yeah. he'll have a bear cover and he'll refill it right back up with five freshmen right. or whatever. But, um, you know, that's the difference. Calipari didn't really, or uh, Tom Crean didn't really necessarily refill the cupboard right away, and I think it's going to hurt them. So they'll struggle. They'll struggle for sure. All right, that will wrap up the college basketball segment here on the National Honor. We'll take a short break and come back with some more sports. I'm sure you love the Super Bowl just as much as us. So why shouldn't you join us on air to talk about the big game for next week's show? Send Buckeye TV who you think will win and what the final score will be by tweeting us at 
by tweeting at us on Twitter or posting on our Facebook wall. The closest prediction will land you a spot on this set to talk about Super Bowl 48 with us. Welcome back to the National Hour. I'm Hayden Grove with Jeff Hammersley here, and we're about to get into a little potpourri of sports, a uh, segment that Jeff called Hockey, Tennis, and Baseball, Oh My. <laughs> what a creative title, Jeffrey. It's very creative right there. First of all, we're going to talk about the, uh, the Columbus Blue Jackets, as you see on the screen behind us. Uh, Buffalo ended Columbus's eight-game winning streak in the NHL this past week. Um, franchise record winning streak for the Blue Jackets. Uh, what do you have to say? What do you think about that whole thing? I think for the Blue Jackets right there, it, it had to end eventually, but Buffalo is one of the worst teams in the NHL right now. And I think the, the glaring problem was you can't give up shorthanded goals. And in that game against the, the Sabres, two shorthanded goals on top of an empty net goal. That was a garbage time empty net goal, but still, you gave up two shorthanded goals. That really, that pulled the Sabres away in that game. And for the Blue Jackets, it, they were not in their usual self after that game against Buffalo. Yeah, the Sabres defeated the Blue Jackets 5-2 on that night. Uh, Derek McKenzie for the Blue Jackets scored a goal as, as well as Mark Letestu. But um, after that game, they kind of had a chance to rebound against the Carolina Hurricanes and were unable to do so again. Kind of, kind of, kind of pulled to Cleveland where they kind of, yeah. you know, they were up and then they let it, let them back in and lost. Yeah, really. I think for the Blue Jackets, they went up two zip. So mm -hmm. you're thinking, hey, they lose to Buffalo. They'll, they'll just come back, beat Carolina, be on their merrily way, play Ottawa tonight. Well, no. They gave up three goals in roughly a three-minute time span. Two goals to Eric Stahl, then and another goal to his brother Jordan Stahl. And really, looking at the, the box score, Carolina outshot the Blue Jackets 35 to 24. I mean, you can have a great goalie, but there's only so much a goalie can stop. And I think for Carolina. They found that window in the third period where, hey, shots just happened to go into the back of the net. And really for Columbus, that killed them in that game. Yeah, Carolina scored three goals in a three-minute period, I believe. It says on here on the sheet. And, uh, you know, just a devastating loss for them. And, you know, if you're a Blue Jackets fan, you definitely hope that they don't, you know, let that keep going because, you yeah. know, they've had two chances to kind of solidify themselves as one of the better teams in the NHL, and they've blown both. Yeah. And, I don't think they've ever really been in this kind of a pressure situation before, especially last year with the shortened season. So it'll be interesting to see what they can do tonight and what they can do uh, going forward. But moving on in our potpourri, um, Masahiro Tanaka decided to sign with the Yankees this week. Uh, the Japanese pitcher signed for a seven-year, $155 million deal. Um, the Yankees paid $20 million just to talk to the guy. I yeah. mean. What are, you thought, what are your thoughts on him picking the Yankees? and what, Was this a good deal or a bad deal for the Yankees? I think for the Yankees, they are going down the same avenue that the Boston Red Sox did with Dice K. I think on paper, this guy looks phenomenal. But I think you're going to go from the Japanese League to the MLB. There is some difference there. But I think it's a toss-up. I mean, I, I was about to say it was a t not, it's going to be a bad deal, but you Darvish turned out. But I think... How many of those actually are there? A guy can be a hot prospect and fall apart when he comes to the majors. I think Darvish and Ichiro are the two big guys who came out of Japan and had very, very successful years in the MLB. Darvish just now beginning. Ichiro on the tail, tail end of his career doing very good. But I think for the Tanaka deal, I think for the Yankees, he'll be there for maybe three or four years, but I don't see him lasting the full seven years of his contract. I'm going to disagree with you. Really? And I don't like the Yankees. I am definitely not, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't, I've never liked the Yankees. But I think the Yankees made a good move in signing this guy because right now the Yankees are kind of in just a, a very weird situation. They kind of have, you know, a lot of veterans who might be well on their way out. And they have a lot of, you know, they don't have much young talent. And I think this was a step in the direction, you know, they have a face of the franchise now, a young guy who's going to be there for a long time. And... You know, I'm not even thinking in terms of, you know, is this guy going to turn out? Because, you know, we've seen it with you, uh, Darvish. I mean, Darvish has been a stud. Yes. Lots, of guy, lots of teams wanted to talk to him. Finally decided to, to sign with the Rangers. Worked out is one of the best pitchers in the league. And I think that's what's going to happen with Tanaka, whether I like it or not. And I, th I think it was just a good move because, um, again, there's just not much of a direction with the Yankees before this signing. I mean, you had guys like Granderson leaving for the Mets. You had Jacoby Ellsbury coming in, and you had, I don't know, it's, they just needed to rebuild, and I think it, I think it worked out well for them. Um, go ahead. I think the problem with me is you're paying this guy. He's now the highest fit paid pitcher in history. Now, Kershaw and Verlander, I believe, uh, Felix Hernandez, CeCe Sabathia, 
Those guys on the list, they've won in the MLB. They've got some Cy Youngs behind their name. Tanaka has nothing right now. He's coming in with a successful Japanese baseball career, but that was then walking to the MLB where that stuff doesn't matter anymore. It comes down to how many World Series rings or pennants can you help this organization get? I think for the Yankees, we've seen them overspend before and not turn out. I think this is setting up the blocks for another time when they're going to blow a ton of money and they may not make to the ALCS. I, I don't know. Right, and I, I agree that they're not going to make it to the ALCS. I just think, it, I, again, my question to you is kind of, where else would he have gone? I mean, what else would he have done? What other team was going to pay for him? Uh, you know, what team was he going to say? This is ultimately his decision, yeah. and he decided to sign with the Yankees. I mean, there were a lot of other teams spending the money, so what makes, you know, the Yankees a worse fit than any of the other groups he was going to sign with? I think... Uh, I would think with the Yankees, this because they have a history of doing the inorganic way. They, they are, right. They're not big on the whole, let's build the organization through a farm system for six years and bring everybody up. How about we just blow the money up front right now, $100 million for you, $85 million for you, $150 for you, bring them in. Let's see, just, it's almost like a video game of sorts. You trade all your teams into your favorite team. So now you got eight guys that are just fully loaded monsters playing for your team and have monster seasons and stats. I think for Tanaka... I think Chicago might have been good. I think Theo Epstein, he had a successful run as the GM for Boston. He got them some World Series rings. I think for him, if he would have gone there, yes, it would have been a struggle in the early going, but they would have built around him in Chicago. It would have been Tanaka, build the bullpen behind him, then start building the team around him. I think for the Yankees, it's now you have five or six different guys who really are on their own island of sorts. It's the Yankees and these six guys not have one guy and build around them like most organizations are doing. Right, and uh, you know, with the, with the Yankees, I'm not looking at. I'm in a weird way. I'm not looking at Tanaka as the as right now either. I'm kind of looking in future because right now I just think they're a mess. You can't lose Granderson and Cano and think, oh, everything's fine and dandy. I mean, they are definitely in a struggle. But as long as I mean, okay, if things don't work out now, at least in three years, he'll be there. Yeah, you can build around him then. I think it's just a longer process. I think you're just waiting a couple of extra years to start rebuilding anyway. Because if you didn't bring him in, then you're still going through a rebuilding period. Things are still not going to work out. Um, as I said, you know, I, they're just Sabathia doesn't seem to be the same pitcher he was. Teixeira is always hurt. Um, you know, even guys like Jacoby Ellsbury, he just won a World Series with the Red Sox, but hasn't proven himself to be a Yankees type of player yet. Mm -hmm. um, I, again, I just I think that this would be a good move for the Yankees a couple years down the road. Maybe not this year, maybe not you know next year, but a couple years down the road, they're going to be happy they did this. And while they don't work, they, while they're not going to win a World Series this year or w even make the ALCS, as you said, I think again it's going to pay off for them down the road. Moving on, moving on with this potpourri of sports, uh, we're going to get into some tennis, and this isn't something we talk about a lot, so uh, props to Jeffrey for putting it on the, uh, on the script this week. Um, first of all, we're going to talk a little Aussie Open, and uh, Stan Wawrinka, am I yeah, saying yeah, that right? Like? Stan Wawrinka won the Aussie Open, and Lee Na, that's a pretty easy one, yeah. Lee Na won the, won the Aussie Open. Um, Warinka defeated Rafael Nadal, who is you know, one of the yep. best, best players, tennis players in the history of the game. Uh, what do you make of this upset? I think it's, I think it's showing the turn, turning of the guard of sorts. You used to have Federal, Federer and Nadal as the two guys. They would duke it out, win it. I think we're starting to see Andy Murray. Djokovic, he's clearly up there. But then you're also seeing Warinka, who's he's finally got his, himself a major victory. But the bigger thing I like to see is it didn't go to five sets. He ended this thing in four sets. 6-3, six, 6-2, six, lost the third set 2-6. Then came back and won 6-3. I think for him it's a big win. It's a, it's a grand slam victory. I think for Nadal, he's now on the back end of his career, I think. I think with injuries and stuff, that's going to force him out. I think for Federer, if he gets to a semifinals at this point on, I think that's an accomplishment by itself. But I think the change in the guard is starting to happen in tennis right now, at least on the men's side. Yeah, we've kind of seen it before where it's like the whole, you know, Andre Agassi, Pete Sampras, they were the two studs. And then you had, um, then you had Federer and Nadal, and they played some great yeah. tennis. I mean, even as, you know, I don't think, and no offense to anybody, but I, I, just, I don't think this day and age tennis is a very popular sport. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Nadal and Federer really put it up there and really made it interesting to watch. And I think, again, I think we're starting to see that. I think we've already seen that a little bit with Djokovic. Um, kind of taking over a little bit. Maybe him and Warenka would be the next two stars. 
Um, but it'll be interesting to see. But on, on the women's side, Lee Na defeated Domin Dominica. No, okay, okay, hold on. Dominica Sibokova. Sibokova, yes. Sibokova, yes. Yeah, that one okay, right. got it right. Go. Uh, beat her, uh, defeated her in three sets and won her second Grand Slam. Uh, she won the two thousand or second Grand Slam event, I should say. She won the two thousand eleven French Open. Uh, anything you make about this? I think for Lee now the first set seven six victory, taking that one in tie break seven three. I think that's a huge win for there. That set up a really a momentum full second set six zero victory there. Uh, I think. We're used to seeing one of the Williams sisters down here. I think for seeing Serena and company, she can bounce in the fourth round. I think that was huge there because that opened the door for essentially anybody who wants it now. She, then Sharapova falls. Then it's a, just a, it's a jailbreak of sorts. Who wants to win the Aussie Open right now? And in the end, Lee Knott gets it, and she claims another Grand Slam victory for herself. Yeah, that's, that second Grand Slam victory is certainly going to propel her to be one of the better players in this game. I think she was ranked the fourth, uh, fourth in the world at this point, but... Again, are we seeing a little bit of a changing in the guard? I mean, that's what I'm thinking here, that maybe Serena's on her way down and some other guys are on their way up. I think, I think we're seeing that right now because both the Williams sisters, they've, had, they've been here since the early 2000s, late 1990s. So I think their time is moving. And I think Sharap Hove, I think she's in the back end, moving off of her prime too. But I think Sobakova, she could be someone that, that's talked about down the line. Lee Knott is getting up there for her age, but she is still consistently in the hunt for uh, – Grand Slam, at least getting the quarterfinal, semifinal kind of stuff. But I think, yeah, I think for the women's side, it's a lot less unclear because it's it can be anybody's game right now. I think for the men's, Djokovic, Murray, Warinka, and Nassim T1, those are the three. But on the women's side, it's anybody's ball game. Yeah, I think just talking about Maria Sharapova a little bit, I, I always think she was more of a, I don't know, I just didn't, never thought she was as good as people said. But, you know, as you said, she definitely is on the backside of her career. Um, it'll be interesting to see, especially on the women's side. As you said, it's more, much more open and much more of a, um, just a cavalcade of different <laughs> players. So it'll be interesting to see. But when we get back, we're going to talk a little NFL action Super Bowl. After talking tennis, we're going to get into the Super Bowl. So uh, stick around. I'm sure you love the Super Bowl just as much as us. So why shouldn't you join us on air to talk about the big game for next week's show? Send Buckeye TV who you think will win and what the final score will be by tweeting us at by tweeting at us on Twitter or posting on our Facebook wall. The closest prediction will land you a spot on this set to talk about Super Bowl 48 with us. And welcome back to the final segment of the National Hour. I'm Jeff Hammersley. It's alongside me, Hayden Grove. Hayden, now we're on in the NFL portion, but before we do Super Bowl. The Pro Bowl happened. Pro Bowl. Pro Bowl, late, last second score from Alex Smith and, De, and DeMarco Murray and a two point conversion, lifting team race over at Team Sanders 22 20. The debate, did you like this kind of Pro Bowl with the fantasy draft and with two start former NFL players making those selections? I did like it. I think it, I, admittedly, I didn't watch all that much of the game, but I think it was a good, I think it was a good system because, first of all, from what I saw from fan reaction, it just seemed like everybody was so much more uh, excited about this Pro Bowl and enjoyed it so much more than they have in the past. And second of all, I think it kind of, you know, brings an interesting twist. Instead of just seeing the same old guys, you know, playing with each other on the American side. and Because at, at, yeah. at this point, every yeah. year there you have pretty much the same guys, yeah. you know, Drew Brees, whatever. Um, but switching it up is always nice, and I kind of think it gives it a nice little, uh, nice little wrinkle in what, in, in, instead of the normal, uh, you know, conference champion or conference you yeah. know, matchup Alignments. but I really I really like this I thought I thought it kind of gave an interest to the players um, I was watching just you know just in, as, as an example I was watching Joe Hayden talk to Deion Sanders Deion Sanders wasn't able to pick Joe Hayden but I think it gave it a little interesting like you know guys were you know working with these legends and I think it was yeah. really neat for them I think it was a good experience overall I mean I liked it too I mean you get Alex Smith Philip Rivers and Drew Brees on the same team that wouldn't happen with the old Pro Bowl Smith would have been the NFC uh, Rivers and, uh, would have been on the, uh, and actually, uh, sorry, Breeze would have been on the NFC. Smith and Rivers would have been on AFC. the AFC. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking Smith is still for the 49ers. But I like how like the intertwines the men of like the two teams. We have teammates tackling teammates, basically. So I thought that was kind of cool to see that happen, too. Uh, next topic, Gary Kubiak going to Baltimore right now with the offensive coordinator positions there. You like that hire? I do. Um, I thought the Browns, especially with you know hiring their new head coach Mike Pettin, um, I think the Browns needed a new offense coordinator. I think Gary Kubiak was the guy. But again, Ozzie Newsom swoops in, 
makes the hire, uh, grabs Gary Kubiak, who kind of just, I don't think he was all that much to blame for the Houston Texans problem. I think there was a lot of things going on there. So I think it was definitely a good hire for the Ravens and uh, will make things much tougher for the Browns, for the Steelers, and for the Ravens next year. Or, I mean, for the Bengals next year. I've, I'm really not a big fan of this hire. I think for as an NFL fan, I'm not, it's like whatever. Steeler fan, I'm like, I'm sort of liking this. But like, if you're a Ravens fan and anybody that watches closely, it's not a big, good hire. I think Flacco, he had, he's had so much change as, with the quarterback coaching position there. He's won a Super Bowl, granted that. But other than that, this last season did make the playoffs. Uh, they've only made it to the Super Bowl once. He could, if he has the right pieces, he can make a couple runs there. But I think for Kubiak, at least in the early going, until they can get some pieces to complement with him, I don't see it being a good hire in the short term. Maybe long term, four or five years in the line, who knows, it might be. But right now, I'm not a huge fan of it. All right. Okay. I can see that. I can see that. All right. Then this brings us to the, the last big topic. It all ends here, ladies and gentlemen. Super Bowl 48. Here's the preview. Denver Broncos, Seattle Seahawks, and Hayden, this game. It's the, one of the best offenses versus one of the best defenses. I could not be more excited. I just think this is, this is the most tremendous matchup you could have imagined. Peyton Manning in that offense, Richard Sherman in that defense. I mean, what a matchup. I, I, I cannot wait to see this game. I think looking at the lines right now, overall rank, the Denver Broncos are number one. Seahawks are 17th. You get that ranking off of uh, overall yards per game. Broncos, 457.3. The Seahawks are getting 339 per game. Uh, also, points per game, Broncos come in first with 37.9. Seahawks are eighth with 26.1. But looking at offensively, too, the rushing side of the game, Seahawks are fourth with 136.8 yards. Broncos 15th with 117.1. But really, offensively, these two teams, Seahawks running game, is going to be going up against the Broncos passing game. Who do you think is going to win that, in that, that advantage between those two sides? No offense to Marshawn Lynch. I'm all for beast mode. I like the guy. He's a great running back. You don't mess with Peyton Manning, man. I don't care if you're Richard Sherman. I don't care if you're Joe Hayden. I don't care if you're Deion Sanders. Peyton Manning is gonna is gonna is gonna pick you apart. And I just think that's gonna be the difference. And is that you know Peyton Manning is gonna do work against that Seattle defense. I, Seattle has a great home field advantage when they play in Quest or. What is it now? I heard it's not Quest Field anymore. It's CenturyLink Field. We made Century that mistake Link a few we weeks did, we ago. I called it Quest, and then I realized, wait a minute, they changed it again. CenturyLink Field is what, uh, is what I believe is the new name of that stadium in Seattle. Okay, so CenturyLink Field. They play well there. Neutral environment. I think Peyton Manning is going to take care of these guys. And, it's, and you know we'll talk about the other aspects of the game, the Broncos defense versus the Seattle offense, and I think that'll be a good matchup too. But... I just think that, you know, Marshawn Lynch is not going to have a, as big a factor on the game as Peyton Manning will. I mean, quarterback is, you know, the position in sports. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's the top. It's A1, and you're at the summit. And um, it matters in games like this. And I, no offense to Russell Wilson, but Peyton Manning is just on his, another level. Mm. I think – I don't think – Payton and company, they're going to be running all over the Seahawks, and this is why. I think opposing yards per game, Seahawks defense is first, 273.6. Passing yards, they're first, 172. That's what the defense is allowing. And put that in perspective, the Broncos are 27th in passing defense. Opponents' yards, they're 356, which is 19th in the league. Mm -hmm. Seahawks are also number one in opposing points per game at 14.4. The, the Seahawks defense, they will clamp down, I think, between Camp Chancellor. Richard, Richard Sherman now, since after his – Post-game interview last week has jumped on the radar for a lot of people, or should, or should I say two weeks ago during the championship game for the NFC. He's not jumped on a lot of people's radar. You match him up with maybe Demarius Thomas or something, if he gets a couple of pass breakups there, that could be huge for the Seahawks, especially if that comes to maybe like a third and six across the middle on a slant route, or maybe a third and five he gets an interception or forces another drop or something. Yeah, and I think that I think another thing to consider is the weather. I mean, I know yes. it's kind of silly to think about, but I think if it's snow, if, I don't know. You know, we're in the midst of this polar vortex. I don't know what the weather's going to be like on Sunday, but I'm just going to say if there if the weather's bad, it's definitely going to change things. Yes. I mean, in the past That's we didn't have to worry about it. If the past in the past we wouldn't have to worry about it. If it was in Arizona, you wouldn't worry about weather. If you were in Florida, you probably wouldn't worry about weather. Being in New York in the middle of or in the beginning of February, it's going to be very, very interesting to see just how the weather plays into this. Because you know, as good as Peyton Manning is, he's never been great in cold weather. And you know, 
Seattle's always used to playing in tougher weather up there in Seattle. So, I mean, I don't know. It, 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 weather could easily level the playing field here. I think so, too. I think with the Seahawks, they can do rain in Seattle. I, if it's a blizzard or there's maybe three or four inches of snow with a whirling, swirling wind, that could be problematic. I think Payton may be able to handle a little bit better because he's in Denver for a couple of years now. But I think if it becomes slushy, snowy weather, I think it's the passing game could stop really a little bit. I think for Manning, don't see him passing 60-yard passes down the field. Maybe if he can get 15 at best, that will be fine. Hope whoever catches it runs and picks up an additional 5 or 10. But I think if the weather's bad, it's going to become a ground game. And I think then Marshawn should be a little bit tougher to bring down, but I still think the Broncos, if, if Marshawn can get through the snow, I think Monty Ball – and no time running to an extent can do the same thing. Not as good as Lynch, but I think they can at least run it to at least set Manning up to try to score some points. See, if, if, if the Seattle defense or the weather, either one, can slow down Peyton Manning somehow, some way, if that happens, there's no way that the Seahawks are going to lose this game. Because, you know, when you're on the ground, you don't have to worry about weather, you don't have to worry about the wind, you don't have to worry about any of that. And I think that that's what Seattle's going to have going for it. I think this game is going to come down to one thing. Can Seattle slow Peyton Manning down? And if they can, they're going to win. If they can't, they're going to lose. And, you know, because I think either way, they're going to have, a, they're going to have success running the ball with, with Lynch and Russell, Man, Russell Wilson, rather. Just think of that combination, a Russell Manning. That Russell and Manning would be A guy awesome. that can pass like Manning but rushes like Russell Wilson. That's a perennial MVP right there. Exactly. But back, back to my point, Russell, if Russell Wilson manages the game, if, if Marshawn Lynch can stay on the ground and play well on the ground, I don't see either of those things not happening. So I think it comes down to one matchup and one matchup only. Peyton Manning against the Seattle secondary, who's going to come out on top? And, you know, if the, if the weather plays a factor, I think that'll certainly swing things to Seattle's side. Okay, where will this game be won? Is it going to be specifically between, behind one unit? Are we talking it's the Pat Broncos passing game, Seahawks running game, Seahawks run defense or pass defense, or, or is it coaching, offensive coordinator, defense coordinator? Where, what is the one aspect of this game that will determine who wins this ball game? Well, I just pointed it out. It's going to be Peyton Manning against the Seattle secondary. If the Seattle secondary can pick him off a couple times, can or win the, the turnover margin? Win the turnover margin and, you know, kind of just get to him a little bit, then they might, they might definitely, you know, pull away with this game. But, you know, I think it's just a matter of, can you slow Peyton Manning down? I mean, if Peyton Manning is going and going and going, you can't slow him down, you're going to lose. It's just that simple. And while their defense is good, and I don't see that particularly happening, just letting him go, 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 I don't know. I just think that the matchup in this game is going to be Peyton Manning against the Seattle defense or the Seattle secondary. And if the secondary isn't up to isn't up to snuff, they're going to have a tough time. What about you? I'm Let me, gonna let's, go, let's hear your. I think side. I'm going to take a different. I think it's going to come down to John Fox and Peyton Manning. That combination of both those guys. Fox has lost the Super Bowl to the Patriots in the way he lost that adventure game-winning field goal. I don't think he wants to lose another Super Bowl again. I don't think he wants to be known as a guy that can take two teams to Super Bowls, but he can't win any of them. And if he loses them in heartbreaking fashion, that makes it even worse. I think if the weather's bad, I think Fox is on the fly going to have to change the game plan. Because if the weather's bad, Manning can't make 60-yard passes. The wind, the air resistance, everything in between, that's going to cause the ball to go rack. And now you're asking for an interception at that point. If you got 15 mile per hour winds happening with a little bit of snow, vision's not going to be good. Pass it can go 40 yards on the money, may shift maybe a quarter yard to the right, that could be intercepted. Nobody knows that, but I think that you can't have play off that chance, especially in a Super Bowl. Maybe game six in the regular season, yes, but when you have a Super Bowl on the line, I think that's when you can't take any chances at that level. But at the same time, you have to think about it if you're John Fox. Worst case scenario, what happens after the Super Bowl? Manning doesn't return. I think that's your offense right there. If you win one now, you can at least say you won something in Denver. If you can't and Manning doesn't come back because of the, the neck, with the, uh, being the test afterwards, or if they don't make it next season to the Super Bowl, it's, it was all for naught right now. So I think between Fox, it can, having Manning, the, the, the whole dynamic between John Fox and Peyton Manning, that's where this game is going to come down to. They can work together nicely and win. If there's some disparity there where Manning wants to do one thing and Fox wants to do another, 
I think that may be enough for the Seahawks to take advantage because they have so many weapons on defense and on offense. I agree. I agree that you know if Peyton Manning and John Fox aren't on the same page, it's good. they're not going to win. It's just not going to happen. Because, but as I as you said, I, I, if they have to change their game plan in any way, I just don't think they're going to win. Because I think that Seattle's game plan is just so much more tailored to the ground game and to the weather and to the, all the external factors. If you know Peyton Manning is the best in the game at X's and O's, and I firmly believe that he can game plan about, around anybody. And I think that's why if the weather's good. Denver is going to win this game without a doubt. But if the weather changes things and it's bad and the wind is swirling, I can't see Seattle losing. I can't because I just don't see Peyton Manning being able to, you know, focus on the ground game and riding no Sean Moreno and Monty Ball to a win. I mean, that's just me. I just can't see that happening. All right. The prediction time coming in. Who do you got in this one, Broncos or Seahawks? And what's the final score? You know me from day one. I'm a Peyton Manning homer. The guy is incredible. He just knows how to win. Beat Tom Brady without a, with barely, very little problem. Beat everybody pretty much this season with very little problem. If the weather's good, and I'm assuming that it's going to be, I think, the, I think it's, in the, it's in the mid-30s this week. I don't think it's supposed to be all that snowy. Denver's going to take it. They're going to make Seattle, Seattle's defense look less than they've been all year. Denver Broncos win the Super Bowl, win Super Bowl 48, the first snowy cold Super Bowl since, I don't know, probably way wow, back in the day. Wow, it's a long while since we had a cold one. Denver Broncos 36, Seattle Seahawks 24. I'm, I've always picked Peyton Manning this season. First jersey pick, I'm not doing the jersey pick this week because I think it's obvious. But I think in this game, weather's a factor, yes. I think if it's 40 and sunny or 15 degrees and snowy, I think it's the same outcome. I think, I think the Broncos, they're just... Too many offensive pieces there set for them. Manning, Demarius Thomas, Wes Welker, Eric Decker. Also, you have No Sean Moreno, you have Monty Ball. Defense, you have Champ Bailey with the senior leadership there. If something, if there's a hitch in the secondary, he's going to help, help you out there. I think in the end, regardless of what the weather is, I think it's going to be 33 27. I think the Broncos, they get by, they don't run away, but they get a close victory against the Seahawks and they bring home a Super Bowl. First time since the John Elway days. There you go. Since 99, I believe. Yep. All right, that does it for co- the, not college football. That, that does it for all the sports. That, that, does, that does it for college football. NFL, we're done now. Now we're going to go off to final stories. In the midst of this harrowing winter, all I can think of is spring and the beginning of baseball season. Last night, as I checked my bedside table, my scarf covered up my glove, almost as if it was saying, soon, Hayden, soon winter will be over and spring will arrive. Anyways, with baseball season approaching, there has been an expansion in re- replay capabilities in Major League Baseball, and they have me thinking, is this how was baseball was meant to be? Was baseball meant to be a game with intermittent breaks to make sure the umpires were right? Was technology supposed to take a, such a central position at the ballpark? I don't know. As a part of me as a baseball purist, I'd much rather see baseball played without replay capabilities at all. With the, already play, with the already in place system, however, it might be better to go all out rather than have bits and pieces that serve a limited purpose. All in all, I really don't care about instant replay. I just want to see the pearly white baseballs flying through the air, even if they're doing so thousands of miles away in the deserts of Arizona or in the beaches in Florida. Baseball, please hurry up. You can't come back soon enough. As you know, Super Bowl 48 will be played outside MetLife Stadium, a place roughly 10 miles away from Manhattan. As you also know, New York tends to be a cold place in the winter. I get it. Football is supposed to be played in football weather, cold, terrible, bleak weather. This Sunday seems to be the perfect example of what real football is supposed to look like. However, the fans in attendance may disagree. Fans are used to braving warm elements in Miami, Tampa, or even in a dome stadium. They aren't used to traveling from their homes to a cold New York, New Jersey area in the middle of the winter. If this Super Bowl doesn't if the Super Bowl does decent, expect every city with an outdoor football stadium to be in the running for a Super Bowl. If it doesn't work, expect, expect warm weather cities for a while to host Super Bowl games. Only Mother Nature and time will control the outcome of the weather for the grand finale of America's game. All right, and that will do it for this week's edition of the National Hour. He's Hayden Grove. I'm Jeff Hammers. He catches on Campus TV Channel 19. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all those things. Goodbye, we'll see you next time.